Hello there. This video you're about to watch is a little different to some of the videos that I've done before. Usually when I'm doing a Bible study with people, we allow interaction, asking questions, giving answers, things like that. When I do a video, usually that is not the case. But this time, I'm doing an experiment and I'm allowing people to ask questions and I'm giving them the answers on the spot. You will see in this video a place where I testified about back pain that I was getting. Immediately after it, I had a sharp back pain up my back. This is uh, not unusual. I would not have done it if I had not been testifying about it. But the devil is listening to your words, and Revelation 12 says he's the accuser of the brethren. The lesson is, don't talk about your sickness. When you're going through a trial, better to keep your mouth shut. I hope you'll put some comments in this video. I'm asking you to say whether you like this kind of video with the questions and answers, or whether you just prefer the straight teaching. Whichever it is, be blessed in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, today I'm going to um I'm going to start a study on it's always God's perfect will to heal every believer. We did a study some weeks back and we explained the difference between God's judicial will, God's perfect will and God's permissive will. I'm going to look at why does God want to heal us? And I'm going to look at, from the scripture, a demonstration of God's will in manifestation through the works of Jesus Christ. So, if we go and look at Jesus first, go to Matthew 26, and I'll read for a few verses from there, starting with verse 39. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Verse 42. He went away again the second time and prayed again, saying, O oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, your will be done. Now this is Jesus facing death. He knows exactly what they're going to do to him because it's written in prophecy. It says in Isaiah 52, his visage was marred more than any man. They knew what they were going to do. They were going to beat him to a pulp. And so what he was praying, he was looking for a way out. But if not, it was always submit his will to the Father's will. Now, if this is what he did in the most difficult time in his life, what did he do in the rest of the time? I'll submit to you, he did the same thing. So I'll go to Mark 14.36 and we'll see another example. And he said, Abba Father, all things are possible to you. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. This is a parallel scripture, and he's basically saying exactly the same thing. The most difficult time in his life, he submitted himself to the Father's will. And of course, we all know that it was the Father's will for him to die on the cross, because he was paying for our sin to be forgiven. Amen. Go to John 4 now, verse 34, and I'll show you another instance where he talked about his Father's will. Jesus says to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. This was a time when the uh, disciples were a bit concerned by the fact that Jesus hadn't been eating food. But it was always God's will. So if you go now to John 5.30, we'll see another example. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. 
because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who has sent me. This is another statement that he was always seeking to do his Father's will. Go to John 6.38 now and we'll see another example. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I think that's enough examples that we can see that Jesus was committed to do his Father's will in whatever situation he was in. So, try another one. We'll tell you what he did. He destroyed the work of the devil. So go to 1 John 3, 8 and we'll read a verse there. He who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might undo the works of the devil. Now some scriptures, some Bibles translated destroy the work of the devil. It really means to untie or lose something like you would untie an animal who was tied up. This is what Jesus came to do. Whatever problems or infirmities or anything else sins and all these things that the devil has put on people throughout the years Jesus came to remove them he came to undo them and let them go Amen, Amen. Go to Acts 10.38 and we'll see another example How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So, when he healed all who were oppressed of the devil, whose will was he doing? Well, the answer? God's will. Yep, yeah, he was doing his Father's will. <coughs> uh, there's plenty of scriptures which show you that uh, sickness is of the devil. Uh, you can start with another one. We'll prove to you the devil's behind it in a literal sense. If anybody gets sick, the devil is the cause. Go to Job chapter 2, verse 6. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. And Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Again, this scripture is showing you that the devil... Is the one who is behind sicknesses. So if you become sick, don't accuse God of putting a sickness on you for any reason. In this scripture, if you look through the context of it, you'll see God allowed it, but it was the devil who actually did it. And this is the this is the approach that we have to all sicknesses. Yeah. Some people say that I do that. God allows these sicknesses to come upon you so as he can be glorified when you get better. Okay. That's what some say, don't they? Yeah, it is true that God does get glorified when you are healed. And in John chapter 9, if you look at that scripture, that looks like uh, that's exactly the situation that was going on there. Uh, but he doesn't put sickness on people just to get the glory. That no, would be no, no. a rather vain thing to do, wouldn't it? Yeah, then, then uh, that's that God. But he does get glorified when people get here. Oh, yeah, we'll really show good. you some scriptures on that later. Um, go to uh, Luke chapter 6, 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 16. This is Jesus. He's in a synagogue. He's about to heal a woman who's had a spirit of infirmity. And this is what he says. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? The Pharisees were going to accuse him of doing a healing on the Sabbath day, which he shouldn't have done. But... Um, this is what Jesus said, Satan bound him, sorry, Satan bound her for 18, three, 18 years. 
And what did Jesus do? He let her free. Whose will was he doing? God's will. He was doing the Father's will. Go now to Matthew 4.23 and we'll see some more. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Got a question? Yeah, it says that you're um, in the synagogues. Is that the Sabbath day or any day? Any day, nearly. Well, it would be on a Sabbath day if he was in a synagogue, wouldn't it? Yeah. So he healed on the Sabbath day. Yes. It's a hierarchy of the law again. This is what the Pharisees could see. Yeah. The hierarchy is laws. Okay, you shouldn't do it normally on the Sabbath day. You remember the hierarchy? Faith, the law, so it was on faith, and faith, and law. So the hierarchy of the law, you do that first, then you do the Sabbath day. Yeah. Normally you do the Sabbath day, but when it comes in conflict. So the, the second highest commandment in the law was. To love your neighbour as yourself. Now then, we know there's a hierarchy to the law. Some commandments are higher than others. Keeping the Sabbath commandments is, we put it in fourth place. The, the obedience to commandments is not at the top of the list. Love your neighbour as yourself supersedes it. So, on the Sabbath day, yes, he was doing somebody a good deed. Uh, and that would allow it without breaking the law. Hallelujah. It would be coming against one of the lower commandments, but that's common in Scripture. I mean, in Matthew 12, 5, for example, Jesus said that the, uh, the priests on the Sabbath, they profane the Sabbath, but were blameless. Why did he say that? Because they had to do twice the amount of sacrifices on the Sabbath day. They were doubling up the work when they should have been resting. But God told him to do it, so that commandment is okay. If you don't understand it, go on our website and have a look for the hierarchy of the law. Um, yeah. Go to go to Matthew eight sixteen now. I'll we'll see in the one. And when the evening came, they brought to him many who were possessed with demons. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all who were sick. Now this is where he's casting demons out of people. Is it God's will for us to cast demons out of people? Yes. Obviously it must be. Because Jesus did the will of God. Go to Matthew 9.35 and we'll see another example. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So whose work was he destroying when he healed all the sicknesses? Destroying the works of the devil. Destroying yeah. the works of the devil. Amen. Matthew twelve fifteen is going to be the next one. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from there and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. So here's another case where everybody who came to him got healed. Look at another example, Matthew 14 verse 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them and he healed their sick. Matthew 15:30. And great multitudes came to him, having with them those who were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them all. Now I've only looked at the, the, um, the healings in the book of Matthew. I haven't read them all. We've just done about half a dozen of them. But I think it shows you quite clearly, if Jesus only came to do the will of God, then healing the sick by faith must be the will of God. Amen. Now, there comes a, a, a question that crops up a lot when you talk about divine healing. 
If it's God's will to heal every believer, why are there so many believers in Jesus who are not healed? Why are there so many who are sick? It's a good question. It could be down to faith. Oh, it's about that definition. Yeah. You remember when we were talking about Mr. Will? Yeah. Yeah, yes, remember what we were talking about? Go to, go to John chapter 5 and I'll show you an example. This is a place where Jesus healed one man and there was many people there who did not get healed. So I'll read from verse 1. After this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For the angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was well, and took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Okay, so in this particular scripture, Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda, he healed one man. Did the man have faith for healing? Answer, no. Yes, Charles. Yes, but you said the pool, that the angels were in the water. Yep. Is there a healing pool or something? I don't yes, once a year, the angel went down into the water, stirred the water, and the first one in after that would be healed. Yeah, so, only one. Only one, yes. So everybody who was there, the sick people, they were all going there in order to get healed, hoping that they could be the first one in when the, when the water was stirred. Okay? Uh, did they have faith in Jesus? The answer is no. None of them. They weren't going there to meet Jesus. They didn't know he was going to be there. But they did believe in healing. And they did believe in healing without any... How can we put it? External aids like drugs and medicines and physicians and things. They believed that God worked miracles. But that didn't mean they all got healed. One man would get healed. This particular one who was healed by Jesus. Here's your question. Did he have the faith for healing? No. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So he was, he was there saying he got nobody to put him into the pool. He wanted to be made well, but he wasn't saying to Jesus, oh yeah, I believe, or anything like that. Yes, Gary? Why did Jesus tell him to keep his body Why did he do that anyway? Why did he do it? Why did he do it? Because it belonged to him, and Jesus told him to do it. If somebody came and worked a massive, massive miracle for you, and then they told you to do something, wouldn't you do it? Yes. 
Well, he, he believed something at that point, yeah, because he's just, he's just got a massive miracle. Did he say that he had been alone, then? No. He did what Jesus He did what Jesus told him. I believe he'd be so excited that he did whatever Jesus told him to do. Yeah, he, he just he just obeyed what Jesus told him. Yes, sir. I've been to cases where that he couldn't walk at all, but now he found the script anyway. Walk. Yes. Have, uh, yes. Why? Let me ask you this question. Why did Jesus tell him to take up his bed and walk on the Sabbath? Why didn't he just walk off and leave him? He healed the man. What was the point in telling him to take up his bed and walk? To glorify God because he'd been no man who'd been in that long. And to see him walk around on the Sabbath would have answered the question of whether he could heal him or not. But the only problem is it. Uh, he, it alienated him in most of the Pharisees and that. Did you, Joe? Oh, the project year, this man's been ill. Yes. People were known of the project year. Right? Yes. Now to see him, right, walking around this club, right, obviously something's happened to him, right? Yes. And people were questioning him. Amen. Amen. People will be questioning him. Thank God, yes, all the glory. I'll give you my answer to it anyway. The answer is, what would have happened if the man had just walked off and left his bed there? It might have been his only possession. Somebody might have pinched it while he was gone, yeah? But Jesus had mercy on the man. You must remember what it says in uh, Mark chapter 2, uh, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. If he tells you to do something on the Sabbath day, it's lawful to do it. Amen. Right? We can see this in other places where God told people to do things on the Sabbath day which were not normally lawful to do. But the rules about keeping the Sabbath day are general rules and there are exceptions when it can be broken. Why didn't Jesus heal the rest of the people? If it's God's will always to heal somebody. The man that had been ill that long, he had mercy on him, he had a prophetic word. Okay. Jesus, yep. prophetic word for, for that man at that time. And he had mercy on him when he'd been that long. Yeah. Amen. You got it right. He'd been there for 30 years, man. 38. 38 years then. Uh, this is my solution to it all. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit to go to that place to heal that man. Amen. The reason why he picked one man out who didn't have the faith and he didn't even recognize Jesus when he came. The reason why he picked him out was because he was a long time sick. You can see another example, I think it's in um, Acts chapter 6, the man at the gate, when Peter healed him, he'd been, he'd been like that for 40 years. Yes, yeah, yeah. There's another one, I think it's in Acts 14 or 16, where uh, the apostle um, Paul told the man, uh, he saw he got faith for healing, told him to stand upright on his feet. That man hadn't walked since he was born, and he was over 40 years old. So I think God just has mercy on people when they have a long time suffering. Believe me, when they've suffered for such a long time, he just has mercy on them. Why didn't he heal the rest of the people? They didn't ask. This is a conclusion that you can bring it to. Why does not everybody get healed? Sometimes God expects something from us. What does he expect of you when it comes to healing? He expects you to be obedient. There are sometimes conditions in the word of God in order to be healed. Sometimes people don't fulfill the conditions and they don't get healed. There is also a case where Jesus said words to the effect that to whom much is given, of him shall more be expected. You might get, some people get trials worse than I get, some people don't. Why? Because God knows what you're able to cope with. You know what I've been through in the past. <laughs> Two strokes and a near heart failure and uh, various times when I could have died, yeah. 
But this is what God does. If I get a test like I've been having now with the back pain, I know it's defeated. It's defeated, but I'm getting tested. And I'm getting tested for several days. It's been several days anyway. But I know the devil can't win it, so I'm giving God all the glory. Amen. And I know some of you have got the same attitude, which is good to know. Yeah. When you get out of the one angle, the Lord will put another angle there for you, won't it? Yes. So another way you go out of that mountain, he'll send you around another mountain to go out of that one. Yes. Like you said in Exodus. It's, it's a trial that we get, and if you overcome, then you step up and you get another one. And this is what we go through in the Christian life. It's trial after trial after trial. Uh, you're always being tested. What happens if you fail the trial? You get it again. And if you fail it, you get it again. You're it again. And you're stuck with that trial until you overcome. Sickness is just another, another thing. It's one of the trials people get. God is just looking to see what you're going to do when you get sick. You're going to go to man for help. You're going to go to God for help. What are you going to do? And the answer is, everybody does something different, don't they? Some people go to natural medicine. Some people go to doctors. Some people go to God. The Bible says, let him call the elders of the church. And not many people do that. Maybe the elders don't have faith for it. <laughs> I can remember doing it once. I asked for the elders of the church come and anoint me with oil. I didn't believe they got the faith for it. But I believed that because I'd been obedient to the word of God, God would now be obligated to heal me. And he did. But that's another story. Go to Psalm 102 verse 27 now. And I'll show you another point. And this is going to be simple, and this will conclude it more or less. God doesn't, God doesn't change. But you are the same, and your years shall have no end. So it's saying that God does not change. Go to Malachi 3, verse 6, and we'll see another example. For I am the Lord, I do not change, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So in this scripture, God is making it quite plain, he doesn't change. He never changes his word, he never changes his character. He does not change. Go to James 1.17 and we'll see another example. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. So the Father, there is no turning with him. He does not turn back. When he decides he's going to do something, he's constant in the way he operates. We read scriptures the other week where it shows that he does change what he's going to do if people change what they're doing you can see this in uh, Jeremiah chapter 18 where God says he's going to do something and then people if they turn away from what they were doing wrong he turns away from what he was going to do to them and so on so this is an example yeah uh, is, it, is it the same occasion right? as we go now and yes Exactly the same. God determined in the book of Jonah that he was going to destroy Nineveh. And after some chastisement, because he didn't want to go and do that, Jonah went and preached. And when he went into the city, he said, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Was it overthrown? No. no. Why not? Because the people repented. And because they repented, he didn't overthrow the city at that time. He did get overthrown later, but not at that particular time. So it shows that God's will, as far as his judicial will is concerned, it changes in response to the way people operate. If they had continued in their wickedness, 
The city would have been overthrown. But they turned away from it, every one of them. Amen? So a little bit got, got postponed. He postponed it. Not, it didn't happen in their lifetime. Amen. Amen. Go to Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and for the age. Most Bibles translate it, and forever. In other words, he's basically saying Jesus doesn't change. He's the same today as he was 2,000 years ago when he came. So, what's God's will? He showed us what God's will was when he went around healing all the people. I'm going to give you two more scriptures and then we'll finish this one. In other words, when he does it then, he still does it today. And he'll still do it today, yes. Yeah, he does it today. No, but we know he does. Amen. We know that. Praise God. Uh, go to John 8, 29. And I'll show you one verse there. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. So, ask yourself the question. When Jesus healed all these sick people, we've been reading that he healed, right? What, was he pleasing his father? Yes. Amen. He was pleasing him. Go to another one. Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. That's referring to God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now those last two scriptures, you put them together. Without faith you can't please God. And Jesus said he did always those things that please him. So how did he operate? Always by faith. He never resorted to natural means in any of the healings that he did. He did it by faith. And now, as Christians, we should have the same Spirit of Christ in us. We should be able to do the same things. Now, I'm aware that everybody is not to that place. In fact, we've seen quite a few healings, but we've seen times when people have struggled. We're not perfect yet. But by God's grace, he'll help us, and he'll get us there. We don't knock people who don't have faith because there's times when we didn't have faith. We wouldn't want anybody to put us down and slap us down for that, would we? Yeah. What do we do if somebody comes who hasn't got the faith? We help them. <laughs> we we put, our, put our faith with what they've got. Um, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So it's awful. What's up there, brother, is of course, our God is faithful and just. Amen. He's faithful and just. To forgive us our sins, to heal us when we ask him. I'm going to make this one point now. God does not heal everybody. He does heal some and not others. It's up to each individual, if they don't get healed, to search the word and find out why. If you've been a Christian for some time and you're not healed, it may be a case of God is expecting you to put some faith up. It seems to me from my experience and what I've seen of other people's ministries that it's easier to heal a relative newcomer than it is to heal somebody who's been a Christian a long time. Mm. God expects more of somebody who's been in the faith for many years. And this is one of the problems. The other one is, there may be something in a person's life which is hindering the healing and you do not know what it is. And God wants them to deal with it first, yeah. Is it because they, uh, they're not willing to change sometimes or it could be that there's something in that heart that they have to put right first? Yes, definitely. I mean, if we um, have uh, unforgiveness against somebody. Yes, un off. unforgiveness can hold it. I heard one case of a testimony where a man was in a healing line, he was praying for sick people to be healed, everybody was getting healed, and he came to a woman with a young child. And he, uh, when he came to pray for the child, because it was the child who was sick, 
he, he just felt there was something wrong. There was something wrong. He just did not have the faith to heal the child. And he knew there was something wrong. So he asked the woman, Are you a Christian? Yes. What church do you go to? Uh, Methodist. And he, he was struggling to know the answer to the problem a little bit. But somebody who was standing by said, That's not true. She's a spiritualist. She yeah, goes to a spiritualist yeah. church. So the man said to her, Go aside. Repent of going to a spiritualist church and then bring your child back. So she did. She realized what she was doing was wrong. It was explained to her. And she came back with the child. And the man laid hands on the child and the child was healed. Now why didn't God heal him the first time? Was it not God's will to heal the child? Of, it was God. of course it was. Yeah. God's will was to heal the child. But there was something hindering. If God had healed the child, when she wasn't telling the truth, then she would have been convinced that going to a spiritualist church was a good place to be. Yeah, which he wasn't. Which he didn't. He didn't want that. Amen. So I think that's going to be enough for today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close it down now. I hope you've learned something from it. I hope you will come and hear more about divine healing because I believe it's always God's perfect will to heal. And if there's any blockages in your life that are hindering you from getting a healing, you can still get it. Just persist. We'll show you some means by seeking, asking, going to the right places. If you can't find anybody else, find somebody who's got Jesus Christ in them. He'll be able to do it. And so I hope you've got something out of this. And if you have, please give God all the glory. Thank you for watching. God bless you all in Jesus' name. Click center to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Click top right to see more videos. And go to our website to see great Bible studies, Hebrew and Greek word studies, and lots more. God bless you.